Good morning. My name is Peter Gondardi. I am the facilitator for this panel discussion. I work with the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries uh, in uh, Queensland, based in Rockhampton. Uh, I just want to remind you that three excellent presenters here. On my one side is uh, Dr. Peter Regan, then we've got uh, Paul uh, Jones, and Dr. Terry McCosker is uh, in via uh, video. Um, I can't see him, but uh, I assume he's here. Um, so we've had three excellent presentations uh, on some of the core issues that are always discussed at Rangeland conferences around uh, grazing land management. Uh, and I think there's a lot of uh, questions that have already come in, and uh, most probably there will be more. Uh, between the three presenters, I just made a quick calculation, there's over 110 years of experience in this field. So it's really a good time to ask your questions and we'll see uh, to how many of these questions we can actually get in some answers. Um, I'll kick right off. And the first question was from Robin Cowley. Uh, she said, uh, Peter, uh, is your moderate stocking rate the safe long-term carrying capacity? Do you think declining pasture condition has reduced carrying capacity? And have you adjusted accordingly? Um, certainly when we planned the trial, I think we did have the right long-term carrying capacity, or we certainly thought we did, based on modelling and producer advice. Since then, and particularly with the last drought, I believe carrying capacity has declined, and we have adjusted the stocking rates down uh, slightly, but that is something that we need to consider in the next phase of the trial, and hopefully we'll have a technical view and sort that out. Then the next question is from Andrew D. Um, Paul, what do you think are primary reasons for producers not spelling their country? Oh, I guess I can only speak from the Fitzroy and the Vertican. Um, and there is actually a lot of, uh, lot of producers uh, spelling yeah. their country, uh, particularly with the great stuff that's happened for NRM groups. Um, I think, I think it, probably a minority that aren't, and a lot of it may just be management as well. Um, across the rest of Northern Australia, uh, probably infrastructure, but um, I'm not really, uh, can't really comment on that. Um, we might we might move on to uh, Ken Hodgkinson here, who's asked the question to Peter. Uh, he said, congratulations on keeping the trial going. Um, he's got a bit of a loaded question here. I assume the treatments have changed plant species richness and species dominance. What is a summary of these changes? Well, in short, there's been a, a loss or a fairly steep decline in our chief perennial grass, which is uh, Bothria chloe awadiana, or desert bluegrass, and an increase in um, annuals, and particularly what I'd call the, the weaker perennials, that panicums and the digitarias. There's also heavy production has become more variable and a lot more flashy, but yes, they have a decline in the perennial grass, uh, desert bluegrass. Uh, a question here from Andrew Ash. He said, Paul, given the spilled areas of uh, fairly small plots, do you know if they received uh, receive a high amount of grazing pressure once they are opened up? Uh, no, no, Andrew, that was a real concern, the design of that, of that trial. Um, the high stocking rate, obviously, it's a, it's a high stocking rate. Um, just uh, with our, our, our graze controls, it's, um, it's very similar. It's something we would observe straight away if it, if it was happening. Um, it hadn't happened. It's be yeah, able to concern at the beginning of the trial that that could happen, and also that the spell plots could massive moribund material wouldn't, wouldn't be grazed at all, and, and neither confident there. Um, the next question is uh, from Leanne, and it's a question that uh, all of us are interested to hear the answer to Peter, and this is for you. Uh, are you optimistic? Uh, just lost you from that. about practices of findings like this. I have uh, you noticed a, a shift in the way graziers uh, manage their country over this 24 years. I, I know it's producers involved in our project. You've got a producer advisory group. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's an interesting question. And after you've given your response, I would be interested to hear from the other two panel members also what they think. 
Well, in, in terms of our producer advisory committee, um, some of them on that committee are very good managers. Or in some ways, we would be learning from them, uh, from their experiences and, and the long-term management um, that they've had on their properties. In terms of the wider adoption, I, I'm really not qualified to say, but from what I hear, the answer is um, not really, because I think there are a lot of, part of it is there are a lot of external drivers that also affect what people adopt. And there's a difference between what they would like to adopt and what they can actually implement. A recent meeting we had with our advisory committee and other graziers uh, highlighted a major area of concern, and that was that everybody was saying how there was a lack of response to the improved rainfall in the last few seasons. And that was being widely reported all over the district, and I know in Western Queensland as well. So we have a real concern that there's a slow decline in the carrying capacity of our land. And basically, people are standing, we're all standing on a sandbar, and the sandbar is slowly eroding away from under our feet. And I think it's a cause of um, major alarm. Um, maybe Terry uh, is he's online. Uh, if you can tell us what is your experience in terms of adoption of uh, all the, the new findings that have come about over the past, I think you were referring to 30 years uh, of some of the, the, the data that you referred to. Uh, over time, uh, is the adoption, the rate of adoption increasing? And what are some of the barriers would you describe? Thanks. I certainly support Peter's contention that we're standing on a sandbar and it's eroding out from underneath us. Um, I first observed that in the early 80s and when I increased the stocking rate in the country in the territory from a beast to 100 acres to beast to 5 acres. And in five years, the desirable perennials had disappeared. And that was alarming to me. So I think um, yeah, we have a real problem. Is it changing? Uh, we were able to get a real lens on this through Project Pioneer, which was funded by the federal government to reduce runoff into the reef. And therefore, the, the goal was to increase ground cover and reduce runoff. What we found was that in the first, so there was a very solid education program with a big support program. And we found in the first one to two years is that the focus was on the business. The focus was on trying to understand profitability. It was also on uh, getting a handle on animal production and was gaining confidence. We found that there was uh, the uptake of grazing management um, and impact on ground cover started from about the second to third year and accelerated from then on. And it had to do with the hand holding, it had to do with the confidence, the, it had to do with a lot of peer support and peer. There was a this process was set up to so with a lot of peer to peer support and. These were the, we were actually forced to go to the highest erosion areas, catchments, and work with people who had not done, the, the, the far and away, the vast majority of the landscape had not done anything previously. And yet by the end of four years, there was significant change across all of those properties. So sum that up, it's, it's really, it was the education component, more than the education, it was the support and it was the confidence to make the change based on economics and the fact that they went ahead and spent nearly 23 or over 23 million dollars of the money in those last few years on fencing and water indicates industry will change if they have the confidence and the knowledge to do it thank you for that uh, i think that is a that is a big uh, topic for for discussion and i think in the in recent years uh, a lot more has gone into to try and work out how people think and what what creates practice change and a lot of good work has been done in all the different groups to look more at the human side. Um, uh, another question here is from Caroline Pettit from uh, Darwin. Uh, Peter, you mentioned incorporating fire as part of the management uh, the management in your in your paddocks. Uh, do you still use it? At, have you done it at, in Wambiana? And what was the effect? Uh, we lost, we've burnt the trial twice in 1999 and 2011. 
and the trial is really due for another fire. We've noticed a, a big increase in current bush, uh, Caruso ovata, and there's also thickening of brigalose suckers taking place. Um, we won't be burning until we get a reasonable season and until we've got a decent fuel, fuel load and, and we have a good seasonal outlook. Um, but we've definitely got areas where brigalose suckers have increased substantially and you can see the grass dying out underneath them. So that whole woody weed, well, not woody weed, but the, the woody component, it's essential to manage that. Um, I didn't show some of the data that we've got from satellite data showing the increase in persistent green cover. And yeah, th that is the other big sleeping um, lion, for want of a better word, in the northern industry is that slow thickening up of the woody vegetation. Um, I have a question here for, from Marie Bowen, uh, and uh, this is to Paul. Uh, will you test whether pasture condition and land condition can improve on a paddock that have been heavily stocked over a period of a good period of time, uh, and when there's been actually actually been good rainfall years? Uh, examples: uh, remove stock from heavily stocked paddocks. Um, you know, to see if they uh, recover uh, similarly to the moderate stock paddocks, um, given adequate rainfall and spelling. Yeah, I think it's, it's a lot of data we've got pointing to the, it won't recover to a, a good composition of perennial grasses. Um, in a previous project, we actually measured the viable seed bank, um, both at site one and, and site two from 2011 to 2016. And there's very low densities in some years, look, no, no viable seed bank of the perennial grasses um, in the paddock. And that's just a function of, uh, well, desert bluegrass, it's long lived and, and doesn't recruit very, very often by um, by seedlings, seedlings and, um, and those seedlings have got to survive as well. So there's some real concerns there. Um, anecdotally, you know, we can, uh, there's a lot of properties that have recovered land condition and um, we don't understand those processes, but it's quite likely that seed does come in from adjoining areas, um, from sort of mosaics in the, in the landscape. Um, so yeah, a bit hopeful, Marie, but um, I guess the data suggests that um, it's, it's going to go to a 2P dominant um, pasture and and golden deer grass is another one that survived there. I, I think it's a it's a very good perennial grass um, and it's one that has growing points well below the ground surface. So it's it's hanging on there in the high stocking rate because of because of the location of its growing points. So um, it it could end up being a, a cornerstone of of production in recovering um, covering sea condition country. Um, so maybe leading on from that, there's been a couple of questions about you know the the trial. Uh, extending it. A um, uh, question is, how long is long enough for a long-term grazing trial? I'm not sure if there's a clear answer to that, but in terms of the work, Paul, that, that you've been doing, where you're actually looking at, at the recovery side also, uh, what would you uh, indicate how long would you need to get a better grip on this? Because you've, you've made some findings, you've come through a really dry spell now. Uh, what, what, how long do you think would be required to, to make, gather some really uh, uh, sufficient data to be able to make a, a not much stronger statement. Yeah, I guess if I can quote David Orr, he said you need to study plants through two life cycles to really understand them, so that would make it nearly 60 or 100 years. Um, but um, now it'd be great to have a, a run of, um, of good seasons to, and I think that's going to need to happen to, with the recovery and then and follow that through. So yeah, it's 10 to 20 years, um, critical I think. Um, Terry, anything that you want to, to add to that? I remember a meeting I had up in North Queensland at one stage with a group of grazers. Um, we were talking about managing Mitchell grass and some of those guys have been managing it for 60 years and there was 100 years of experience there. And amongst those people, they said there was no, nowhere near enough experience and knowledge to know how to manage Mitchell grass. So I'd agree with David, you know, a couple of lifetimes um, at least. Yeah, can I just comment on that? Please. Um, the Wombiana trial has been going, this is our 25th wet season that we're going into. And if you actually go back through uh, different parts of the trial, um, the, our actual conclusions that we drew, drew in the first five years are pretty different to those after 10 years and quite a bit different from those after 15 years and then after 20 years. So things have changed. And I know funding agencies don't like to say that to hear this, but 
we have to we're we're dealing with systems that take a long time they can change very quickly and they can change very slowly we're looking at decadal climate cycles and we're looking at plants um, that can live 20 or 30 years so we just have to be in there for the long haul unfortunately um, I see we're running out of time is that the case um, so I thank you very much for participating thank you to the panel members I think it's been an excellent uh, 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 gathering thank you